I want to start by thanking Medel for Paulo Albuquerque to for the invitation to be here to say I'm to please to share the panel with at least one member that I know and two others that I come to admire and appreciate, uh, particularly your intervention. I'll try to do two things in my talk. The first one is trying to make sense of the increasing role that the European Court of Justice um, has been called in to play in reviewing the rule of law within member states. And my argument is that in light with that, what I had anticipated years before in Central Europa 7, in that opinion as an advocate general and that I will be briefly address, my argument is that that role is unavoidable, is bound to grow, not to decrease, but also, and that will be the second part of my talk, that role is bound to create two tensions and two challenges for the future role of the European Court of Justice. The first one, because the reasoning that supports the role that the Court of Justice has played in this area is inherently expensive, both within the rule of law and with respect to other areas of democracy and fundamental rights. And therefore, it will lead the Court to increasingly have to decide on more and more cases of a sensitive nature. And second, that role, and that's the second tension, that role may also come into conflict or in tension with how the rule of law is itself protected at the level of the European Union. And I will try to highlight where those tensions might emerge. So let me start with the first part. And I think it may be important for us to start by discussing or understanding, or at least in my case, making explicit why we believe that a supranational entity such as the European Union, through its judiciary, the European Court of Justice, and also the General Court, should and can and actually has a role in reviewing issues of fundamental rights and the rule of law within member states when those are not areas of competence for the development of EU policies. And I think there's three reasons, more general, not even with, only with respect to the European Union, that can be presented to legitimate how an external supranational entity is legitimate to second guess issues and decide on issues of the rule of law or fundamental rights or democracy with respect to a sovereign entity, and in many cases, democracies. The first reason is what is, we could describe as moral and political externalities. And it basically is the argument that violations of fundamental rights in a member state may cause political and moral externalities in other member states that share a particular endeavor or common project with that member state. To a certain extent is to say that when a group of member states undertakes a collective project that has in particular a political dimension of integration too, that there is a commitment that that project is supported on a common set of values, that if they are not respected by a member state, even in only in its internal affairs, causes a political and moral externality for the other states. The second reason is a reason that in fact has supported the role of international jurisdictions in reviewing fundamental rights within states, in the domestic legal order of states, is that that we could describe as a form of externally self-imposed constitutional discipline on the part of states. I think the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention is a particularly good example of this. We know, particularly in Europe throughout history, that sometimes the constitu constitutional and domestic mechanisms of controls, checks and balance, protection of fundamental rights may not be sufficient. And therefore, states decided under certain circumstances to bind themselves to an external form of control that constitutes an additional layer of constitutional protection. Not one that is internal, domestic, but one that is external. And this can be presented as the second reason, and is certainly 
the one that, in my view, underpins and legitimates a good part of the role of the European Court of Human Rights. There is, however, a third possible reason for such kind of role to be played by a supranational jurisdiction. And it is one that, in my view, applies in the European Union. So I think the European Union includes both the, the other two, but also the, this third one. What is that one? It, it relates to when states have entered into a form of integration that generates such a level of legal interdependence between their respective legal orders that violations of the rule of law, fundamental rights of democracy, or, or democracy in a particular member state end up generating violations of fundamental rights with respect to the supranational legal order itself or in the legal orders of another member state. That is, two examples. When uh, 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 the violation of a fundamental right in a particular legal order amounts to a violation of that fundamental right with respect to the piece of EU legislation, for example. And I will give more examples of what I mean with this. Second one, example, when uh, uh, by virtue of this level of integration, a court of another state is called in to enforce a judicial decision taken in violation of the right to a fair trial or fundamental rights. In this case, it's not simply, and this is the difference, this is the important difference, the authority to intervene in protecting the rule of law, fundamental rights, or democracy results from the need to protect and legitimate the effective fun functioning of that level of interdependence, of that zone of interdependence, of that regime of interdependence. That is, what legitimates intervening in this case is protecting those values within the EU legal order itself. It's no longer acting in order to protect fundamental rights at the level of the member state, but because the violation of those fundamental rights at the level of the member states amounts to a violation of the fundamental rights with respect to the powers, the rights given by that legal order. And I think the case law that we have been discussing and the recent case law is exactly the product of that. Now, this is not something new in the EU legal order, and that's why my opinion already was highlighting the possibility of something like that becoming concrete. In fact, even before my opinion in that case, there was another opinion uh, that I would say was even bolder than my opinion in Central Europa 7, that was an attempt at accommodating the opinion of Advocate General Francis Jacobs in Constantinidis years before, in a more feasible way for the European Court of Justice. Uh, and what was the opinion of Advocate General Jacobs before the Central Europa 7? It regarded basically the case, some of you that know EU law uh, well might know the case I mentioned, it was called Constantinidis, and it basically involved the right of someone that was exercising the right of establishment in Germany and had not seen his right to a name properly protected in Germany because it had been mistranslated. And the question was that what was at stake was not directly the exercise of the economic activity linked to the right of establishment, was his right to a name. But what the Advocate General Jacobs said in that case was that the violation of a minimum standard of fundamental rights in any member state, even if directly did not affect the right of exercising the economic activity could deter the movement of a citizen of one member state to exercise that economic activity in another member state because if that person will not benefit from a basic protection as fundamental rights, will not move in the first place. So there was no direct link with the restriction of the right of establishment, but the violation of fundamental rights of a certain type, in his view, would amount to restriction on free movement. And Centro Europa 7 was an opinion uh, uh, where I used the opportunity, I knew in that case that the court will not address my proposal uh, that I made with respect to fundamental rights, but I wanted to put it there for the court to think about it. And then I offered the court a much easier solution that the court actually took and decide the case. But it stayed there. The purpose was for the issue to be there. And my, the difference with what I was proposing 
in Central Europa 7 with respect to Konstantinidis was that my argument was that not all fundamental rights violations on a case-by-case -case basis will, should be considered as restricting free movement, but only those that constituted evidence of a systemic problem with fundamental rights at the level of the member states. And what was the reason why was, some people then wrote articles saying that this amounted to a kind of reverse Zolange, and indeed it was a little bit the reasoning behind my opinion. But the fundamental concern that underlied my opinion in that case and differentiated it from Konstantinidis was that I knew that it would be very difficult for the court, as it will be a challenge for the future with respect to the cases that the court is developing, to start reviewing all possible violations of the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. It simply doesn't have the institutional resources to do it. I always say to my students, law is always a product, of, is also a product of demand and supply, the demand for justice, but also the supply side what courts can do. Courts cannot decide all cases that will be deserving judicial and legal protection. So they have to define priorities and standards with respect to proportionality, more or, or, or less or higher degrees of scrutiny are a way for courts, basically, to regulate the supply. And so what I was trying to do in, in Central Europa 7 is, was to set a threshold, a threshold that would allow the court to get, play a role in guaranteeing that level of fundamental rights, rule of law, and democracy, but without getting involved in reviewing all possible rights. But these cases already alerted for what then, Associação Sindical dos Juízes, and all cases involving Poland, Rom Romania, uh, and even Hungary, have made clear now. It is that this level of interdependence uh, makes it so that, as the court made clear in the Associação Sindical dos Juízes Portugueses, but also in the Polish cases, it's unavoidable that uh, the lack of judicial independence in a member state amounts to a violation of EU law because it undermines the effectiveness of EU law. And this is the important point. The justification for the court to intervene is not to protect the rule of law with respect to Polish cases and Polish law. It's because if Polish courts are not independent, it's the effectiveness of EU law itself that is put into question. Now, this case was then followed, as it was mentioned already, also by an additional element in the Selmer case, highlighting the extent to which this would also create problems on with, when national judges are called in to enforce judgments or arrest warrants from other courts or other, or, or other states or judicial entities that, for example, do not comply with, with, with the rule of law. Now, Selmer is interesting because it seems that he's more demanding in the assessment that national judges have to do than the Court of Justice itself has been with respect to infringement cases. Because uh, uh, Selmer is, uh, in fact, a merger of what the Court of Justice had said in Associação Sindical dos Juízes Portugueses with the Court's decision on Aranciosi and Caldaru, on the European Arrest Warrant, that where the court basically requires two things. On the one hand, an assessment that there is a systemic problem. So if there is a systemic problem, the first, the first test is passed. But the second one is a requirement that that systemic assessment is tested in that specific case so as to determine that it has affected the capacity to provide a fair, impartial judgment trial in that case. And this is, and Mark de Verde said already, what already raises possible criticisms, because how is a national judge to go beyond the systemic assessment, that is already difficult, to assess how 
that case, how that procedure, how that judgment, how that trial actually took place in the country, of, in the member state of origin. What moreover may depend of getting information and cooperation from uh, uh, the, initial, the judge of the other country that is excel, himself or herself suspect of not being independent. This is a difficulty for the court, but I think one of the reasons, it's something that I will discuss below uh, on why the court does that. Now, I think that this case law is, on the one hand, as I said, unavoidable because what is in question is the protection of the EU law itself. It's not intervening to protect the rule of law or democracy or fundamental rights at the level of a member state, but it is to protect these same values in the EU law itself. So it's very difficult for the court not to be logical in this understanding of what are the consequences of this. But this case law raises two major sources of tension, and that's the second part of my talk that I want to address with you. The first one is that it is inherently expansive. The reasoning that the court makes using Article 19, linking it with Article 47 of the Charter, to basically say that if there's no judicial independence or no protection of the rule of law in a particular judiciary of a member state, then it's the effectiveness of EU law itself that is in question, is applicable to many other issues, including aspects that are related to democracy and the rule of law. Let me give you an obvious example, something that I've also raised a few years ago already as a possibility. Think about the following, and this is perhaps not as hypothetical anymore either. Think about a situation where in a particular member state there's actually no genuine freedom of the press, no media pluralism, or even no freedom of expression. And you have there, in that member state, elections to the European Parliament. Articles 10 and 14 of the Treaty of the European Union are clear that members of the European Parliament are to be elected through free and fair elections. At the, in the European Parliament, has to comply, as the European Union in general, with democracy. How can we say that the European Parliament is democratic and that its members have been elected in free, through free and fair elections if some of them have been elected in a context where there is no freedom of the press or no media pluralism? The reasoning here is exactly the same as with Article 19. And someone, I would suspect sooner than later, will bring it to the court. That is, how can, we, how can those members of parliament that have been elected in country, I'm not going to mention states, but you can think of some of them, in a particular member state, how can they take office in the European Parliament because they have not been elected to free and fair elections? That's what's going to be challenged. And in fact, in Junquera, in the Junquera judgment of the Court of Justice, the court already indicated very slightly that even if it is, if elections are to be organized and they have to take place, and the results and the ballots are defined by national authorities, that they have to comply with the principles that are in the treaty. So this is just an idea of more cases to come. Now, uh, but we could see this in more areas. The areas related to, it, to it free movement, like Jacobs in Constantinidis or I in Central Europa 7 was mentioning. Uh, when there is a systemic problem with fundamental rights at the level of a member state. Can we actually say that citizens of other member states are not deterred from exercising their, exercising their free movement into that member state? Very hard to justify this. And in fact, the European Commission, and perhaps the Council itself too, if it endorses the proposal of the Commission and the Parliament, recognize this implicitly in a forthcoming legislative act that's called the Media Freedom Act. There is now being planned at EU level a Media Freedom Act that is aimed at setting minimum standards for the protection of media freedom. And the legal basis is the internal market. The argument is that if there's no minimum standards for the protection of media freedom, then you are deterring the exercise of media as an economic activity within member states. So the legal basis is in the internal market. 
Now, by highlighting this, I'm just highlighting the extent to which the, this, the logic inherent in the case law that the court developed with respect particularly to Poland and the rule of law is bound to bring more and more cases and get the court more and more involved in this. In addition, there's a second element that is prone to increase litigation, even simply with respect to judicial independence and the rule of law, is that in all the Polish cases, the court highlights that the assessment is to be then taking into account all circumstances. And this is a product of a difficulty that the court faces. Because the reality is that if the court is, it would say, well, we don't accept the Polish rules because it's the president of the republic that appoints the judges, then it will get into troubles with other member states too. The court knows that the same formal rules as to the judicial appointment of judges may have very different results depending on the other rules of that on, in place in that legal order and also on the political culture of that country. And so this means that the court very carefully says, well, we have to do on a case-by-case -case analysis to see if the entire context and the entire set of circumstances and all that is taken into account on deciding the disciplinary procedures, on the appointment, on the renewal, on the immobility of judges, if they really amount or not to, to a violation of judicial independence. We can understand this on the part of the court, but we also know what's the consequence. Case-by-case -case decision more cases, more litigation, and also an extreme difficulty for national judges in applying even more the Selmer criteria. How are they going to do it? The second, uh, this leads me to conclude this first tension. It is, this in my view will require the court to address how it can develop this line of cases without its caseload becoming unmanageable, while guaranteeing coherence in the, case law, in, the, in the case law, that it doesn't start being argued, well, you apply this rule to Poland, but you don't apply this rule to Spain, for example, or, or, or things of that time. And, or, and at the same time, providing good guidance to national courts, where they will be called in through the standard of Selmer to play a role. The second tension, and I'll be shorter with this one, regards the co coherence with how the rule of law is protected at the EU level itself. And not only the rule of law, but also including judicial independence and other principles. And this is the product of what I've called in a past article, the imperfect nature of EU constitutionalism. Now, you lawyers like myself, we've always talked for many years of the constitutionalization of the EU legal order, but in that article, I was arguing that there's a deep tension between the nature of politics in Europe that remains deeply intergovernmental and its decisions being deeply intergovernmental and the legal constitutionalism of its legal order, the constitutionalization of its legal order. Why? Because in many instances, the decisions at EU level are still framed by poorly intergovernmental nature that enter into conflict, into shock, with the requirements of a genuine and perfect constitutional legal order. In fact, the court itself was faced with such a challenge in the Polish cases by the Polish government that said, well, how can you say that we are a political, you have been appointed by national governments. Moreover, you are subject at the end of the, your first six years of mandate to a decision on renewal by national governments. So, if that is fine, why can we not subject the same thing to the Minister of Justice in Poland? The court was asked this. And the nature on how the court dealt with, dealt with that argument indicates a certain lack of comfort. The court's answer on that was extremely brief, brief and formal, highlighting the difference between the nature of the judicial mandates, but in one sentence, and then mentioning two things. One, that the appointment was made by all member states and that means by all national governments. It's, the court didn't develop this argument, but I would understand this argument as meaning that the fact that all governments ultimately appoint the judge of the nationality of a member state would constitute a mechanism of control that that judge 
is not simply indicated for political reasons by his or her national government. It seems to be the underlying argument. And the second argument the court raises is the role of the independent panel foreseen in Article 255 of the treaty now. That didn't exist at the start, but exists now. That is an independent panel that assesses all appointments. But that, as you know, in the treaties, is treated only as a consultative committee. Now, some questions remain open in this respect. What if national governments do not really scrutinize each other's appointments, but actually simply agree to defer to each other political decisions? What if the court were to establish that, in fact, even if the decisions, it's one of the few decisions that is not taken by the council, but it's taken, the decision taken by all national governments, it's an ad hoc act. What if those decisions are ones where national governments basically reach an agreement and say, oh, you can appoint whoever you want, and we can appoint whoever we want. Allowing this will be tantamount at, at allowing national governments to do through the EU level what the court is not allowing them to do at the national level. Second issue. So far, member states have always respected the decisions of the panel of Article 255. And this is a very strong argument to say. But what if they will not do it in the future, in one example of the future? Now, it could be, and it will be my argument, that the court could build in into Article 255 a mandatory character by using precisely Article 19 and the rule of law argument, by saying the only way for the mechanism of appointment of the judges of the European Court of Justice to be itself in conformity with the rule of law is by making mandatory, by complying with the decision of the Article 255, a kind of corrective interpretation. Now, whether or not these are indeed requirements that the court would accept and should be read into some aspects of the rule of law in rule of law is something we don't know, but something we might come to know soon in the context of two contested appointments of the European Public Prosecution Officer. What exactly what I said happened. First, national governments agreed between themselves that they could appoint whoever they wanted without the other ones really being involved. And there is votes of different member states actually stating that that was the outcome. And second, the recommendation of the independent panel was not followed. Now, whether the court will seize the opportunity to decide these issues in the context of these pending cases on the EPPO is difficult to know. It may be because the cases raise interesting and hard admissibility questions, and it may be that the court will prefer not to be seized of the issues and actually use admissibility instruments not to have to address these hard questions right away. But these questions, and other questions on the tension what EU law is requiring on the rule of law at the level of member states and what the rule of law is at the level of the EU itself are looming and will need to be addressed at a certain moment. Thank you.